Hello, everyone. You know, one of the biggest questions I get is about hormones, hormone replacement, hormone therapy, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and especially about the conflicting uh, information on estrogen in menopause, before menopause. We were scared to death about estrogen replacement in 2002 when the news media flashed that estrogen causes breast cancer, increases the risk of breast cancer, strokes, and, and other terrible conditions. What we really have found out and has teased out through the years is that estrogen is very, very safe in and of itself. And so the progestin, synthetic progestins, not progesterone, bioidentical, but synthetic progestins are really the bad actor and were the bad actor in that study. We know some good things about estrogen now that can really help us. And the questions are often when to take it. Am I taking it safely? Uh, how do I know how my body is processing is and really what what good does it do for me? So we'll talk about all of that today with a guest on my show, a dear friend and colleague, Dr. Carrie Jones. I'm, she is just an amazing uh, individual and I hung out with her recently at a conference we were speaking at in Las Vegas. So I got to spend some time with her and uh, on a personal level, as well as again, learn from her amazing depth of knowledge, especially in the hormonal field. So she comes at it from a not as a naturopathic physician, which is a beautiful compliment to the way I was trained. And so I love to love to learn. I love my naturopath. I think in retrospect, had I known about naturopathic medicine in the 1990s, I probably would have taken that route. I went the osteopathic medical route instead. And again, focusing on women's health. I love it. So Dr. Carrie Jones, she is an internationally recognized speaker, consultant, and educator on the topic of women's health and hormones with over 20 years of experience in the industry. And she's been dubbed the queen of hormones. So Carrie, welcome to the Girlfriend Doctor Show. It is good to have you here. Oh my gosh, what a wonderful intro. It's lovely to be here. <laughs> well, I am glad you're, we're here to talk about um, estrogen. Well, tell me a little bit of your backstory. How did you become, how did you choose naturop naturopathic medicine and how did you choose to focus on women's hormones? I was set to go to medical, conventional medical school. I wanted to either be an OBGYN or a pediatrician. And I grew up in the South, though I grew up in Lexington, Kentucky, and my health class, or what a sex ed class, whatever you want to call it, was taught by the high school football coach. So you can imagine how that went and how little information we got. And when I got into college and realized the volunteer programs I was doing at the hospital were not the way I thought medicine should be. I, I mean, I'm from the Midwest. I didn't know how medicine should be, but I thought, not this. I don't want to do this. I moved to the Pacific Northwest and found naturopathic medicine. And I thought, this is where I need to be. And when I was in the program, I found a mentor who was a women's health. Hormones was for expertise. And I realized how little I knew about myself. So selfishly, I kept learning about hormones. And when I would tell my patients when I was a student and then a resident I, all about hormones, I had so many women of so many ages go, I didn't know that. I didn't know, you know, just I'm sure as you hear day in and day out, so many women are just like, I didn't know that's how that worked. I didn't know that's how that happened. And I went into private practice. I was in practice um, over 10 years, probably 12 or 15 years focused entirely on hormones, and then uh, took a break to become the medical director for a hormone lab known as the Dutch test. So I just stayed in the hormone realm for um, a decade, two decades now. Um, and even though I don't work for the Dutch test anymore, I still keep up on all the hormone literature, just as you said with estrogen, because wow, it is controversial. And I was in medical school in 2002. I started in 2001. So my mentor was perimenopausal when that study came out and um, it sure caused a lot of earthquakes in the women's health field. And I'm glad that that cruise ship is turning, writing itself all these years later. Oh yeah, it's so true. And then when you look at hormones different ways, and I think this is really important, we'll talk about what the Dutch test is 
and why that's a great test. It's something I like to do on, on most all of my patients at one time or another. But, you know, the importance of the way we, our bodies detoxify estrogen. So first that's, you know, there have been so many misconceptions about, okay, estrogen, is it good for us? Is it, you know, should I take it? Should I not take it? And when should I start? We're hearing um, many of these issues come up in, in the, in the media, especially when it comes to brain health. And I think that one of the things that, you know, I speak about as well is that that connection of, of, of hormones and how they affect our neurotransmitters in our brain, how we think, how we feel, how we emote, right? Those are important pieces of, of, of life and living and also what's disrupting our yes. natural hormone production and how important it is to course correct that. So I love that you've been, you know, in depth in the in, with the dutch test and looking at urinary hormones so tell us a little bit about that we can draw hormones of course in blood and that's great and i people say oh, is that bad should i not do that so oh, no no you it's totally fine get your progesterone get your testosterone get your estrogens drawn in, in a blood test but when you move into more advanced testing with urine testing which is exactly what you think it is you pee on a strip of paper a couple times a day and let it dry, mail it back to the lab. You get an in-depth look at these hormones known as metabolites. It's basically where does estrogen go? So you make an estrogen, you use the estrogen, and now your body has to break it down because sadly you can't keep the estrogen forever. It has a time limit. And so when you break it down, your estrogen may or may not choose a healthy path. Unfortunately, not all the pathways in our body in the breakdown process are what I would consider maybe, you know, the, the best course, they, some of them do have some potential side effects. So when we break down our estrogen, the Dutch test lets us know, are we choosing one path over the other that maybe we would or wouldn't prefer in the body? And that's really nice to know as women, because some of these paths are also quite estrogenic themselves. So if somebody says, I'm having really heavy periods, I have heavy, you know, clots, I've been growing fibroids, my breasts get full and tender. I have PMS. So all of these like low progesterone, higher estrogen type symptoms. It's nice to see at various levels where that estrogen is going. And is that contributing to this estrogen excess type of situation? So I really like the Dutch test for that added piece that I can then do something about. You can do something about, we can do it with lifestyle and diet and supplements and nutrients of how do we course correct. Right now, exactly. And so when we talk about that whole piece about the estrogen detoxification, how we're metabolizing estrogen in our body, I mean, it's interesting to know that there's hundreds of estrogens, right? I mean, there really yes. are hundreds, the metabolites, different forms, and, um, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's pretty fascinating. And so when um, we look at the urine, we look at the estrogen metabolite pathway to see, okay, what's the healthiest pathway versus what's unhealthy and again, targeting some of those, um, some of those avenues so that we can improve how our body is using estrogen. So whether we're making it naturally or we're supplementing with it, whether it's oral or transdermal mm -hmm. estrogen or, or even vaginal estrogen, we want to look at what our body's doing with that. So, yeah, it's important that, you know, I am fully in your, I agree with you, the camp that estrogen should not be vilified. I am a big fan of estrogen. I'm not quite there yet, but when the time comes, I will, you know, happily go on estrogen to preserve all the things in my body. But like anything, I know I also want to, um, you know, direct where it's going. So that's, again, like I said, some of those metabolites maybe aren't the most beneficial <laughs> to the body. Right. And I want to make sure that I'm optimizing which way it's going over the other. And I think that's really nice for uh, men and women, but because um, the, the detoxification pathways are the same, male or female, but for for women who are like, I want to be really proactive, like I really want to reduce risk. Um, this is where we get into that comprehensive information of, oh, estrogen does the body good. You know, however, it's like Goldilocks, we have to get it just right. Yeah, that's so true. So talk about some things that improve the pathways. So when we look at estrogen metabolite pathways, the two, four and 16 estrogen <laughs> metabolite pathways, I don't want to get technical with everyone, but you know, just that concept of what's going to improve our detoxification pathway that we can all be taking, you know, doing right now to improve that hormonal pathway. One of the biggest families of foods that I was just reading a research paper on last night, it was foods 
spices, herbs that sort of optimize all these estrogen pathways. And I was reading the whole article and I don't know why I didn't think to look at the authors, but I got to the end and I thought, wow, this is such a well-written article. And I realized it's by um, two people who I just adore. One is Dr. Deanna Minnick and one is Romilly Hodges. So who's, and they are great when it comes to phytonutrients. So in this paper, through and through cruciferous vegetables win. So your broccoli, your kale, your Brussels sprouts, your broccoli sprouts, if you're into sprouts, you know, that subset of foods, that family of foods really does help multiple levels over. So if you are not getting enough vegetables in, um, or you're curious what vegetables you should eat, really focus on those cruciferous vegetables. Now, and it comes to spices, rosemary and uh, turmeric, hands down, over and over in this paper, rosemary, throw some rosemary, fresh rosemary, dried rosemary, Use it in all your things, add turmeric to um, your cooking when you can. And I love that we can use these foods over and over. Parsley, parsley is something called apigenin in it. Really helpful for estrogen detox. Your citrus, so like think of your oranges, um, it, they have an ingredient called naringin in it. Antioxidant, helpful for detox. And so just knowing this information, you know, we, we talk about eat the rainbow, make sure you get your vegetables in. It's for a legitimate reason. Like it's a legitimate, you know, we're trying to help you. <laughs> we're trying to help you help yourself. Well, and that's been studied, right? Studied over mm -hmm. centuries. I was like to say the, you know, ancient physicians to the kings were, were there prepared their food. Yeah. So food is medicinal. And like, so when I made my books, I'm like, every menu has to have a medicinal is medicinal menus, combining yes. the herbs and the spices and the different food groups to really make it a medicinal healing hormone balancing food. And so yeah. when you talk about parsley, like my, my favorite is my mom's uh, tabbouleh. So of my Palestinian course. mom's tabbouleh and that's parsley and lemon juice and olive oil and tomatoes and onions. And it's just like, oh my gosh, I can, I can eat. It. And I use broccoli sprouts instead of the cracked wheat that is part of the traditional um, tabbouleh just to give it that extra, that similar crunch and without adding the gluten, so. <laughs> Which, and broccoli sprouts are my actual favorite and you can grow them yourself really inexpensively. Obviously you can take it as a supplement, but um, growing your own broccoli sprouts, when you grow broccoli sprouts, they're they're known to have the sprout, not, not the actual full head of broccoli, which you know, but for everyone listening, the sprout, when you chew or chop it up, these two magic ingredients come together. They're in the sprout. They come together and they form a third ingredient. It's called sulforaphane with an S. And sulforaphane opens up some 200 pathways. It's like opening all the doors. It like unclogs all the drains, you know, like it pulls up all the manhole covers. Like it just opens and says, get out. Like you can go now. And it's great for your detoxification pathways, not just estrogen, but chemicals and toxicants and other hormones that just need to go medications that are on their way out all those things and so i love that just you know a little handful not you know two tablespoons of broccoli sprouts which you can grow yourself just make sure you're getting organic seed um daily or actually you can even research has shown you can do it every other day really makes this huge impact and how you work your detoxification process so i love that you add it to your tabbouleh because um, delicious for one <laughs> and so beneficial for two. Oh, I love it. Okay. But you're going to have to tell me how you make, how you grow your own broccoli sprouts. I'm so I don't, I can't grow anything. Succulents are even a challenge for me, but I can grow broccoli sprouts. So I buy <laughs> organic, hundred percent organic broccoli, uh, the, the broccoli seeds, just buy the broccoli seeds. And then I have a, uh, glass, a ball, the glass, um, jar, the ball jar, you know, and then I have a lid. So some people, my lid, cause again, I don't grow things well, but I bought a lid on, you know, don't hate me, but on Amazon and it's a mesh lid that screws onto my ball jar. And so all you do is put one or two tablespoons of your seed. You fill it with water, soak it overnight. And then you flip the ball, the jar upside down, drain all the water out and you leave it upside down. So I have it in a bowl so it can continue to drain. And then every day you just fill a little bit of water and then you swirl your seeds flip it upside down, drain it. And within a couple of days, they start sprouting and you just keep doing it to the point where they're ready to eat. And so then you can pour them out of the, out of the ball jar and store them in, you know, pat them dry with a paper towel or, or a cloth and store them in your refrigerator. And then just little, you know, sprinkle them on your salad, sprinkle them on your soups, put them in your smoothie, just eat them. You know, if you have something that you're eating a spread on top of, throw some broccoli sprouts on. And so it's, 
thankfully seeds are not, they're not that hard. M mold is the big thing. And as long as you keep it draining well, if you keep it tipped upside down so the water can come out, your seeds will start sprouting in a couple of days. Okay. Okay. I'm going to try that. I'm going to try it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now, of course there are supplements you can buy, you know, some people go, that's too much. I do a broccoli sprout supplement and that's okay. But, um, if you're into trying it at home, you just, and they, it's just in a little glass jar, you know, a ball jar fits on your counter and you yeah. can have your own. Yeah. Plus when you're doing the active, right, the active eating and chewing yes. and having something freshly made that, that you actually help grow and that you're eating fresh. I mean, that's better than anything you can buy in the store and it has additional benefits. I think there's a whole process to the lifeblood of something you're eating that's actually alive and sprouting that yeah. makes it even that much better and healthier for you. So, yeah. so broccoli sprouts, so furafanes, definitely dim, diendol methane. And yep. Um, and all three carbon all those are all from our cruciferous vegetables help with healthier ox um, detoxification of estrogen down the nice two pathway and away from the four and 16 pathway which when we're out of balance like when we have a higher four and 16 that's when it's associated with more risks for breast cancer right especially the four pathway so the four pathway um so for people listening or maybe a little unfamiliar so when estrogen gets broken down it first can go down these three pathways and that's considered in its entirety phase one detoxification and they're numbered the two pathway the four pathway the 16 pathway just as dr anna said and so the four pathway the one in the middle if it keeps going it will detour, detour down a pathway that starts with a q called the quinone pathway and the quinone pathway if it continues it will result in DNA damage. And we don't want DNA damage because that's where we have the increased risk for cancer. Because if there's damage to the DNA and our DNA repair system can't fix it um, well enough or it's it's moving quickly because there's a lot of damage, then the risk for like, oopsies, the wrong thing was created, the wrong sides were connected, and now it gets the message to create cancer. So we don't want it to go down that Q pathway, which is why we use those foods or why we use that sulforaphane or the DIM, as you said, D-I-M or indole-3-carbonyl. And sulforaphane actually helps redirect as well. So the broccoli sprouts um, keep us on the right pathway, but also redirect. So if you are accidentally headed down that Q pathway and you eat broccoli sprouts regularly, it will regularly like stop, you know, remove you off the Q and, and push you back on the green path, on the good pathway. Um, but glutathione is also helpful on that pathway. And acetylcysteine, which is NAC, is also helpful on that pathway. It's We call it like our stop gaps. Our body's really intelligent. We have the pathway, but at the same time, the body says, I, I got to throw some toll gates in there so I can turn you around. And that's where it's nice to have these, to get these extra antioxidants into our body, either through food or through diet, so that we do kind of turn turn off that pathway and get back on the two pathway, which is the pathway we prefer. Yeah. And it's something like having worked with so many clients who've had breast cancer and we and mm -hmm. follow these numbers or even at risk or, or just in general checking these hormonal pathways. And I see an imbalance or a high four or high 16. So an unhealthy ratio compared to two, like the two to 16 ratio mm -hmm. or the two to four. But what I'll see is when when they turn that ratio around, they feel so much healthier too. Yeah. So like they feel the difference. So many times, you know, we prescribe drugs and medicines, et cetera, and they don't feel, actually feel better. Mm -hmm. So it's also important if, if someone is taking estrogen, I think that's why I really like the Dutch test and another company that looks at these urinary hormones or a couple others, but the HUMAP test. I mean, there's some really mm, good doctor's data. ways, yeah, doctor's data to look at these um, estrogen metabolism pathways. And even in the blood, we can look at the, um, two and 16 ratio in the blood. And I think the four two quest was doing that lab. Do you know, Carrie? Are they I have not, and I have not looked at it recently to know two 16. Yes. I haven't looked at the four, the, the numbers, um, you know, they're, they're tiny, the, you know, the, the metabolite themselves are actually really small. So that's why most people, even in the cancer world do like urinary testing, maybe not so the Dutch test, but a 24 hour urine because it all comes out and then they can catch it easier than, than when they draw the blood. And so um, that's why I've always just stuck to urine because I just often see that in the literature. 
Plus, we can see other things like our cortisol curve yes. throughout the day. <laughs> so important yes. to look at that. I've been flatline under the curve for a few years, finally got it boosted back up. But it oh, is, is, is that challenge. And I also want to talk about oral, the way we take estrogen, the way we take mm. estrogen matters. So, and, and with testing too, I mean, what like is your, what's your preference, oral versus transdermal cream, patch or gel or vaginal root or pellet? Those are some that, of the trophy. Yeah, so, many, so, so many options. So, so the first options. thing, if somebody has never done estrogen before at all, usually what I'll start them with is the patch, to be honest, because um, it's easy. They don't have to think about it. They just have to change it twice a week. They can get it. It's bioidentical or what we call body identical uh, menopausal therapy. They can get it at a pharmacy. It's often, not always, but often covered by insurance if they go that route. And it's a nice introduction to them of a sort of steady state estrogen. However, I do find, and I will ask, tell me about your life. You know, if, if somebody says, oh, I've heard, I've heard vaginal estrogen is the way to go. I said, you can totally, but you can't use it as lubrication. <laughs> your partner, male or female, I don't care, doesn't want that extra estrogen. So it will sort of cut back on spontaneity if that's a thing for you. Um, topical cream. Well, I want to go back there a second oh, and talk about that, that yeah. estrogen vaginal, because we are getting, uh, you know, thankfully more physicians and, and um, people in the menopause space are saying vaginal estrogen, perfectly safe. The research on if you've had breast cancer, yes. vaginal estrogen, perfectly safe. And as a gynecologist, yeah. I have examined people who have had used vaginal estrogen, whether it's a tablet, an ovule or a cream, and I see them two days later, and it is still in the vagina. It has yeah. not well absorbed. And so it's really, and that is, you know, again, you think, oh, well, I just have to use it, you know, in the morning when I'm having sex with my partner in the evening or whatever, again, reducing spontaneity. Yeah. So that estrogen transfers to your partner. And yeah. sometimes it's just, again, not very well absorbed um, for some people in, in some situations. Plus there's yeah. other things in with those creams. Of course, I'm biased because I made <laughs> vulva, which is DHEA, and that's fine for our partners typically, you know, and so, and it also, I did it so it absorbs within 20 minutes and you can massage it in and that makes it really easy too. Huge, because I do like, for the women it works, I love estrogen in the vagina, either estradiol or even estriol. Estriol and vaginal dryness can work like a charm, just like DHEA. Um, how again? But however, if I have a very active couple, and that I vaginal dryness is a big concern for me, so I want to address it. But also, if she says, "I well, we're pretty active. I don't want my partner getting all this estrogen." I agree. I'm like, well, let's try a different route for estrogen and use DHEA or DHEA instead. Absolutely, Something a little and better. The thing too, estrogen works on the mucosal layer. Mm -hmm. DHEA works all the way down to the muscularis. So it actually, you see that you see much better results. You can definitely do them together though. True. That's true. And both, which is what I love, both are uh, safe. If you have a history of breast cancer, mm -hmm. um, which is a good thing. And I see, and then with creams and gels. So if somebody says, well, I have an estrogen cream, I rub it in my arm. What can happen again, it can transfer. And so if you had children late in life, which is not uncommon. And if for example, with a 15 year old, so <laughs> yeah. And so imagine if you are in your forties and you, but you had your baby, but it right up against perimenopause menopause. So now you maybe have a toddler that you co-sleep with, or you're hugging to sleep or you're snuggling with, and you routinely are applying your topical estrogen on your arm or on your thighs, wherever you put it, I'm just aware of this information. I'm just like, you know, we need to, I need to know this because the topical, even though the gel, I believe research has shown some of those gels do absorb a whole lot better um, than just a generic cream. Um, but still, I, I want to be very, very careful. So I have preferences, but also work with who I'm with. And I'll be honest, I was never trained in pellets. And so I'm not a good person to ask on pellets. I know a lot of women love their pellet. When they got in, get it inserted. Um, the unfortunate thing is, if you don't love your pellet, um, then there's nothing I can do. Like I'm working with the, I'm trying working with your body over the next couple of months to help you process it, and so we can go a different route. Yeah, and I don't like estrogen pellets because they usually diffuse at a different rate than testosterone pellets. If you know, we don't know where they're going, man, you know, managing those higher, much higher levels of estrogen. So you have to be very, very careful yeah. with estrogen pellets. So. 
Um, so, and it, those are different ways. And as far as how our body metabolizes estrogen, oral versus transdermal, do you see yeah. a difference? Is it safer one way or another? In your the, trans, the transdermal, so meaning like the patch or the gel or the cream, um, definitely what's considered safer. So when you swallow estrogen, um, there's some literature to show that is the increased risk for cardiovascular stuff. Um, but stroke also the way, well, I'm sorry, stroke. Yeah, stroke. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so even when you, anything you swallow, the liver, we call it first pass. So the liver gets first swipe at it and can take a lot of that estrogen and get rid of it, or it takes a little estrogen. It kind of depends on what your liver is up to. And so if you're constantly swallowing your estrogen, um, we would see when at the Dutch test, it would kind of be all over the board, what was coming out, therefore what you were absorbing. And so, but I do know, you know, some people, I don't know very many people who prescribe oral estrogen anymore, um, but I do know it's obviously still available and can happen. And some people love it, but the majority, I would say in my world, don't they prefer something that goes on the skin or um even in the vagina you know something that route instead yeah How about no, you i agree yeah. yeah i agree avoid oral estrogen because of the risk of stroke and blood clotting and increase yeah. in inflammatory markers so yeah. and we already become pretty inflammatory when our estradiol drops down to menopause I was just reading a research paper the other day and the authors were very bold about it. I mean, they were like, you go immediately into a pro-inflammatory state. I don't know who designed us. I am not thrilled, but like who thought that out, but the drop in hormone and automatically that's the one we suddenly are pro-inflammatory. And a lot of women listening may go, but I'm already inflamed. Like I'm already in my thirties or forties and inflamed. That's not fair. I'm like, I agree totally. So let's not do oral estrogen and increase that risk even more let's go a different route right and then timing like the estrogen window concept and like for me you know and i'll ask you too like for me there's no end end time on hormone therapy for my patients as long as yeah. they want to live well do well you know think well move well yeah. all those good things as long as they're doing good things for the body regularly detoxing etc yeah. then i don't have a time an age limit on hormone therapy so what about you I'm agree. Same, same boat. Yep. I, and I understand, uh, there's been a lot of varying information of you should only do it for five years. You should only do it for 10 years. You should do the lowest dose for the shortest amount of time. And unfortunately what has been shown is that the minute you stop, you lose the benefits. It doesn't, it's not like you do it for five years and then you get 15, 20 more years of benefit. It's if it's not in your body, it's out. And I want it in for the, for the heart, for the joints, for the brain, for the mood, <laughs> for, for the, all the immune system, for all of the things. Now there is literature on timing to start it, which as you uh, alluded to, that you really definitely want to start it at least within the first two years of your of period menopause, stopping. First two years. Yeah. Of menopause. So when your period stopped, when you get that, when you're um, the definition of menopause, if people don't know, of course, is 12 months, no cycle. So in the 13th month, you're menopausal. So starting estrogen and most women start before then, because most women um, are like, oh, I haven't had a period in six months or eight months. And I'm like, oh, you're real close. And you're having all these symptoms. Let's go ahead and start. But the reason for that, the big um, that concerns me is the brain loss, the gray matter loss, the hippocampal shrinkage in our brain. If we didn't get on estradiol um, within those two years, which a lot of women can uh, relate to because they say, I'm having brain fog. I can't remember. My short-term memory is not as good. My recall isn't as good. I have to make lists now. I didn't used to have to make lists. I get lost a little more. And then of course, all the mood, which is what you said in the beginning, the connectedness, anxiety, depression, um, feeling part of a community, feeling love, having love, and I, th I don't want, I don't want any part of my brain to shrink. <laughs> no, so, no, definitely. You, need and that, <laughs> you know, we need estrogen for gluconeogenesis in the brain yes. to give our brain fuel. Yes. And so that in muscle and in, in our heart and our, in our mm -hmm. muscles. So that's an important piece. So curious about your prescribing like pattern, because I typically will start with, you know, as the hormones change the DHEA, um, progesterone and pregnenolone, testosterone and estrogen kind of in that order. As I'm working on detox, detox is always one of the first steps. Do I give them my hormone fix book and say, do the 10 day 
hormone, keto green hormone detox. We supplement, I supplement them with um, support for phase one and phase two. So the Mighty Maca Plus, mm -hmm. sometimes a, additional supplementation, have them do that kind of foundational. Let's cleanse the <laughs> pathways. Let's detox yeah. the liver. Let's support kidneys and all that good stuff during this. And also glucose metabolism by bumping into ketosis and really cutting down on those carbs, especially in perimenopause so that we can have that, that, you know, less load on uh, less toxic burden on the body as we're trying to use the hormones that we have. Yeah. And that's an important piece Whether in half, I always tell clients, you have to do that seasonally as well. Like every, mm -hmm. every time the seasons change, which in Texas is only twice a year, but we were <laughs> trying to get at least four times in a year. So we really to focus on that. But, um, how about you? Like, what is that for you? That very, very similar. Generally, it's same DHEA, progesterone. Um, the top runners definitely in uh, perimenopause as, as actual um, hormones I prescribed. I do the same, you know, some detox support, adrenal support. A lot of women, they, the act of perimenopause is stressful. And at the same time, usually your life is considerably more stressful. You have kids that are teenagers or graduating, going into college, or maybe graduated college. You have parents who are getting older. You're generally in your forties, like really solidly in your career. And it's just a lot. And then on top of it, your body completely changed. So adrenal support, DHEA, which of course DHEA is part of adrenal support. And then progesterone, Pre pregnenolone. I, in practice, did not use a lot of pregnenolone back in the day. Um, and stuck more with progesterone. And now the more I read on the cognitive, the neurocognitive and mood effects of progesterone, or excuse me, pre pregnenolone, it is a neurosteroid. As, as you know, what happens is it can cross up into the brain and it does good. And I've had more menopausal women late, lately tell me I've added in, you know, like 25 milligrams of pregnenolone and I just feel so much better on top of their hormones. They said, I just, my mood is better. I just feel better. I feel, I'm like, oh, you've got all that love that good neurosteroid um, up in the brain. And then I agree, estrogen when the time is right, testosterone when the time is right. Yes. Yeah, not too early either. So, you know, with yes. my I would plug for my own balance cream right now, because pregnenolone, I put pregnenolone and progesterone in uh, my balance cream. And so we, you know, and I also put tripeptide in. <laughs> So that's very anti-aging and essential. So it gets rid of the age spots, sunspots. I mean, if you're going to use something, let it have some cosmetic benefit too. Yeah. That's, my philosophy. <laughs> that's my philosophy. But also, you know, for men and women, I mean, you know, men, progesterone and pregnenolone are really very good too. And especially using it around the temple, you know, mm -hmm. temples around the um, head, neck and chest area too. Uh, that's really well absorbed and also and close to the brain, mm -hmm. but also progesterone for sleep. Yeah. Keep tryptophan active to support your, you know, your neurotransmitters and, yeah. and pregnenolone yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 And we, we hear that and see that and feel that ourselves as women all the time. I, when I was a lot younger, I would have, I would have clients who'd say, you just wait, Carrie, you just wait. When you turn 45, you're not going to be able to sleep anymore. I was like, no, I'll have it figured out by then. No, they were right. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely sneaks up on you. One day you can sleep and the next day it's not the greatest sleep of your life anymore. And it, unless you do something about it, it continues because of those hormone mm -hmm. shifts. Yeah, it, it makes us humble. I said, I wouldn't be doing this without my own journey to hell and oh back. So gosh, no kid. And I, I feel a lot of empathy for all the women everywhere because you and I are in this field. So we know what's going on biologically, physiologically. But if you have no idea, I can, I a hundred percent empathize with you. I know it can feel rough and I know um, in medicine, it's not very well talked about or, or told about. And so even if you go to your OBGYN, you know, they may be more focused on the younger baby years. That's what their expertise in. They are not an expert yet in perimenopause and menopause. And so it can be really frustrating. And so hopefully everybody listening yeah. reads Dr. Anna's book and gets her stuff because I mean, she's definitely on the forefront of education around it. Well, and that there's like, because we don't have so much training in our medical world on menopause, right? Mm -hmm. And then also it doesn't have to be via prescription or like, if you don't have access to someone who's prescribing, keep looking to get a good yeah prescriber with a functional medicine background. That's really important, but there's so much power within us. Mm -hmm. Just by making little 
tw you know, little tweaks in our mindset and, you know, the, I, you know, what, how we think throughout the day, how we move, what, how we nourish our body. I mean, there's so much within our power. And I know you do this too. Like, you know, when I see a patient, I have them do the questionnaires and I do the lab tests, but till I get those results back, I put them on, you know, my detox, the keto yeah. green hormone detox and mighty maca at least right i may or may not use progesterone at that time depending on their age and symptoms etc but when they come back in for their results they're already 90 percent better i mean yeah and i like to claim that 10 percent that don't <laughs> need me right I'm like 100 percent better they really don't need me but when you're yeah. empowered like that and that's what i want women to know the longest living we heard dr um uh dan butner the author of the blue zones the longest living area is not one of those people are on hormones yeah right so yeah. we have to remember that too but they're also you know living in nature connecting it's completely really well. different lives than we have in the hustle bustle of the city and um climbing yeah. the corporate ladder or you know whatever people are doing uh trying to raise families and age gracefully um it's a very different lifestyle you know i read the blue zone stuff and i'm like oh that's lovely that sounds so nice that sounds so Fantastic. And then I look around at my house and, you know, the, uh, you know, the light and I'm like, but reality is where I am. Oh, it's, totally. And I'm like, not, oh, until I'm gonna, I win the lottery. <laughs> well, I'm always like, I'm going to plant a garden. <laughs> Every I time I read that, sprouts. I go to a lecture. Like, <laughs> like it's my one thing I can grow sprouts. <laughs> That's it. I'm going to start with sprouts. I'm going to start with sprouts. You know, sometimes I just plant yeah. things and yeah, they're not hardy enough to survive me. <laughs> well, and you're also in Texas. So yeah. Well, tell our hardy. audience, I mean, there's so many questions. I know we could talk about this for a long time. So I want our listeners to definitely put in questions, you know, give us some questions and topics for um, more on this on this topic or what questions you have. Definitely follow Dr. Carrie Jones on Instagram and also at drcarriejones.com. And, you know, she's just a wealth of information. And Carrie, you also have a podcast. Tell our listener about that too. I do. It's the Root Cause Medicine Podcast. And um, I will be having you on very, very soon. So stay tuned as Dr. Anna Kabeca will be one of my guests. I'm honored. I'm honored. All right, you guys. So check her out. This is amazing. It's always really important. We can all, we're continuing to learn, continuing to stay up to date on the research, safety profiles, efficacy, the best methods. And again, it's not the same for everyone. But what we do know is to reduce your toxic burden, to reduce the xenoestrogens in your environment, choose clean products, clean, you know, detergents you're washing your dishes with, you're washing your clothes with, you're washing yourself with. Those are important, really important aspects for that can affect our, our body's ability or our toxic burden or hormonal xenoestrogen burden. It, that affects us so much. Just cleaning up those things, you've done something good to yourself. So don't feel overwhelmed. Take one step. Think today, what's my one next right step? And be sure to share that with me. Share this episode with your friends. Check out Dr. Carrie Jones. And I look forward to seeing you till next time. Thank you, everyone.